Welcome, and thank you for joining us for our next installment of the Costume Society of America's Oral History Series, where we sit down with one of our esteemed members to learn about their career in dress and their relationship with CSA. Past examples can be found on our YouTube channel where this conversation will also be made available. To help keep this content free for all, please consider making a contribution to CSA. I'm Katie Baker Jones, and I have the honor of serving as Vice President of Internal Relations. In this installment, we will be hearing from Dr. Abby Lilithan, who was elected to the 2023 Class of Costume Society of America Fellows. She will be interviewed by Dr. Dr. Linda Welters. Please allow me now to introduce Dr. Welters. Dr. Linda Welters is Professor of Textiles, Fashion, Merchandising, and Design at the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Welters has been an active member of CSA for over 40 years. She served as editor of Dress, president of the Northeastern Region, member of the National Board, and panelist on the Scholars Roundtable. She was named Fellow of the Costume Society of America in 2004. Dr. Welters has researched European folk dress, archaeological textiles, American quilts, and American fashion. She has shared her research finding, findings at CSA's regional and national symposia. Collaborators on publications include other longtime CSA members, specifically Trish Cunningham, Margaret Ordonez, and Abby Lilithan. Dr. Welters received her PhD from the University of Minnesota, her MA from Colorado State University, and her BA from St. Catherine University. Welcome, Dr. Welters. Thank you, Katie, and welcome members of the Cosmic Society of America. I'm going to introduce Abby now. Dr. Abby Lilithan has been a professor of fashion history and culture at Montclair State University since 2008. For 11 of those years, she has served as chairperson or deputy chairperson of the Department of Art and Design. Abby was previously a faculty member at the University of Rhode Island. Her doctoral degree was earned at Ohio State University. Her MFA in theater design was earned at Florida State University. She is still an, an inactive member of the United Scenic Artists, Local USA 829. In the 1990s, while working on her dissertation, Abby worked in the New York apparel industry, sourcing textiles for a private label apparel manufacturer and managing menswear and tailoring at the famed costume studio, Barbara Matera Limited. So a little fact about Barbara Matera is that Hillary Clinton had Barbara Matera make the, the first dress for the inaugural, the first inaugural of Bill Clinton. Her undergraduate degree is a BFA in theater from the University of Georgia. Abby served twice as a CSA board member, served on two symposium planning committees, and is currently in her second term on the editorial board of dress. She was the first Adele Filene student travel grant recipient. Welcome, Abby. Hello. Thanks for that lovely introduction. This was recently found by my sister and I when we were looking through a scrapbook my mother had gathered. So I wanted to share it. I just thought it was so precious that I was trying to type before I was two and a half. <laughs> so there you go. Um, My first question is that I know that you had a career in theater before being uh, involved in, in teaching and fashion history. So can you talk about that a little bit, how you got started? Sure enough, I can do that. Um, I just want to say I was working at Barbara Matera when we built Hillary's dress. I was not involved, but I was there. So it was fun to uh, watch it be produced um, by a wonderful uh, set of artisans. Um, so I worked at Barbara Matera primarily. That would be the key element of my uh, theatrical design elements career. I was not designing there. Obviously, I was working in the uh, business and workroom side. Um, and I uh, worked there not only on my uh, first sabbatical, which was very brief in, in sort of early days, but I worked there when I was working on my dissertation. and. Um, they were very good sustenance to me, both Arthur and Barbara. Um, I have to say that I was exposed to a lot of really talented people, not just performers, and some directors came in, and of course, um, uh, designers, and I wanna name two designers in particular, Julie Taymor for Lion King. I was working there when Lion King burst onto the scene, and um, my tidbit is that um, I was working in purchasing. I was 
purchasing manager or assistant manager at that time. And um, the costumes have a, a lot of beading on the lioness corsets and wrangling those beads, pure metal and pure bone and certain stones. I mean, Julie Tamor was very particular. So I was the bead wrangler. That's what all the design assistants called me, which I fondly remember. And of course it won um, the Tony Award for costume design. Julie Taymor deserved it. And the second one I'd like to point out is working um, briefly with Gabriella Pescucci, who won the Academy Award for The Age of Innocence, the film. And that was 1993. So 98 and 93, you could see I was stepping in and out of Barbara Matera because they were so generous to uh, let me stay. Um, I also worked with Edie Falco. She was a receptionist receptionist at the time and whenever she had to go out on a, a film audition I stepped in and did reception also so um, I was uh, Edie's right-hand gal in the reception field so working there I was exposed to so many talented people flower makers feather curlers jewelry makers fabric painters I mean, it was just an amazing and wonderful job and um, I'm really glad I was there um you, yeah you were in a, a theater department at one point right sure yeah i taught at the university of south florida after i got my master's degree at florida state i went to um uh pennsylvania stage company in allentown and left after half a season after <laughs> there was a slight conflict with the producers on, my, on our part between us and so i went to um uh teach first as an adjunct, but then I took the faculty position at the University of South Florida. And we had a wonderful costume studio with staff. And um, yeah, I taught there for 12 years. And that's where I first taught fashion history. Although I would say I, I was mildly knowledgeable at that time. I was reading the book as I went and um, trying to present the information to the students. Yeah, I think a lot of people can relate to that. <laughs> things one step ahead of the students. So what got you interested in fashion history? Teaching that course or? Yeah, no, I, well, in part, I mean, I, there, I, I will, I'm going to say there's two things. Um, so teaching that course, one of the, there was a light bulb, light bulb moment teaching that course when a student, not a theater student, I will say, but an art student who took the course, talk to me about, gosh, I wish we were learning more about the why, you know, the sociology of it all. And it really got me thinking, you know, and uh, it, it turns out to be what I'm interested in as well. Um, once, once I could turn my head in that direction and I wasn't trying to be a designer. Um, so I, excuse me while I look, my other activity in terms of that was that uh, the teaching was that, um, I was working both in, of course, creation and then trying to teach the history. And, and um, you know, once I could concentrate on history, I could go a lot farther with it. Let's just put it that way. And so I, I, I used that light bulb moment there as well as another. So let me describe the other. Um, after I finished my master's degree, but before I was teaching at the University of South Florida, I worked in Washington, D.C. And... Um, I worked at Arena Stage, where our upcoming conference will have some people go on a tour. And, and there was a light bulb moment while I was living in Washington, DC, because I was pursuing an MFA in acting. And instead of some student who was doing the MFA in costume design, winning the costume design award that year, I won the costume design award. And I was studying acting. So that was another light bulb moment. And between those two things, one earlier and one later, um, you know, I knew I was interested in costume much more than I was interested in acting and more interested in designing and making costumes eventually. So that's what got me interested in fashion history. Yeah. Okay. So um, from having been around you a lot, I know that you had an upbringing in a military family. So I'm wondering how that influenced, if you could explain how that influenced your work. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Um, so obviously, 
your family environment can affect your life very much. And of course, that affected my development um, in two particularly meaningful ways. One is that um, my mother was a sewer, of course. I think many women were sewers in the 20th century. And um, she came from a poor background, ag agrarian, poor background in the South, in, in South Georgia. And my mother just could not make herself buy clothes if we could make them at home, right? So with my sister and herself and me to dress, we made clothes at home unless they were such a thing that we couldn't do that. So I learned to sew really early in my life and to alter patterns in order to achieve what I desired and, you know, could buy the, the shoes and the pocketbook, but I, you know, wasn't allowed to buy trousers or tops or dresses and not in a mean way. I don't mean it that way. Um, and so I was really imbued with a deep appreciation for that kind of process and for textiles because we'd order wonderful textiles from mail order textile companies. The other aspect that I want to point out is um, my father as an Air Force officer, my parents met in officer's candidate school and my mother had to leave when she became pregnant. Um, I mean, her officership, but my father, of course, continued his career. My mother worked in the civil service um, around Washington because I mostly grew up around Washington. Most of my um, K through 12 happened in the suburbs in Fairfax County, Virginia, in Alexandria. So my dad was in intelligence and national security and we were in Thailand um, as the Vietnam War burst open. Um, for our side, right, that we became involved. And we were there when Kennedy was assassinated. So I have deep memories of living in Bangkok. And living in Bangkok, there were some really great things for the kid, me, who was interested in textiles. So the streets are called soy, and on the soy that we lived in, there was a hand loom studio just down the street. And um, it was safe and I would toddle down there by myself. I was in fifth and sixth grade, and I'd spend hours and hours with the uh, Thai ladies who were weaving Thai silk. We couldn't really communicate. I had a little language because that's required in the system that I was studying in at the international school. I could count and you know say simple things to them, and we would giggle and laugh together, but I, I hung out there for hours and hours by myself with those ladies. So, oh. That, that influenced me greatly because I'm still interested in looms and weaving, although I'm not a weaver, and I'm still interested in textiles, and I'm still interested in Southeast Asia. Okay, so that's interesting. And next question is about the coursework that you had at Ohio State where you completed your PhD. Who was influential? What courses were really inspiring to you? Yeah, that's an exciting thing to talk about as well because again, it's going to come multiple strands have to come together to get me to the being I am today, right? So I'd have to say, uh, first off, that Gwendolyn O'Neill um, was my professor for theory, and it was illuminating. Um, not that we were studying the level and uh, diversity and complexity of theory that we apply to dress and fashion today, it was um, more focused upon um, retail and um, processes for con about consumers, you know, so focused on the business side rather than um, other sides, right? Sociological sides that aren't really about purchasing or um, um, individual taste and aesthetics. So um, that was really important. At least it gave me the frameworks that in the end, Linda and I would work to reject when we wrote Fashion History, A Global View together for publication in 2018. But amazing course and an amazing intellect in Gwendolyn O'Neill. Um, another strong influence there is Elizabeth Barber. Elizabeth Barber, our wonderful CSA member, was brought in to be our history professor for the graduate students when um, myself and Susan Hannell, another CSA member, were, were studying there for our um, degrees. and um, I'd never been interested in prehistory or prehistoric Greece in particular or prehistoric textiles at all. 
until I took this course. I have to say it was always something my sister sort of played with, you know, prehistory and um, all the discoveries. And I, I just had always separated myself from the things that my sister had been interested in. You know, that happens, right? So um, Elizabeth Barber's, um, it was a quick course. It was like three weeks long. It was just really illuminating. And I did a project that we'll look at a picture in a moment about the project I did for my class, which is what got me the Adele Filene travel grant, the first one. So thanks to Elizabeth. Um, also, I'd like to say that Susan Hannell, as a student, influenced me greatly at Ohio State. We were roommates eventually and spent many hours reading each other's work and crit criticizing it and complimenting it and working with it with one another as we you know, plowed our way through our coursework. We had a few courses together and you know, some not, but I have to say the art theory class was really tough. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I have to say that Trish Cunningham has been a mentor to me ever since um, my days in school there. Uh, I haven't said, but I will say now that my professor unfortunately passed away and that's why um, Elizabeth Barber was brought in. And then Trish became the faculty member, but I'd already finished all my coursework. So I needed um, the mentor to get me through my dissertation, this um, project that I had established about Batik in America and how did it get here. And um, so Trish Cunningham was, was my mentor through there and has still remained a mentor to me to this day. And of course, she's a fellow as well. Sounds like a pretty good graduate program. <laughs> it was great. It was really great. So when did you first join CSA? You know, I think it says 1983 on my CSA card, but thinking about it in preparation for this interview or conversation, I figured out it had to be 79 or 80, 1979 or 80, because that's when I was in graduate school for my master's degree in theater design at Florida State University. And so it had to be then. So it was Don Stoll was um, my professor. And of course he was a very early, not a first member, but a very early member of the organization. And he just was always talking it up and saying, you guys need to join, you need to join. So I finally joined. Um, I wanna say on the side here that he brought in Melia Davenport for a visit and to talk to all of us. This was the theater design program, right? So it was really fabulous to meet Melia and um, um, especially to hear her perspectives on how she went about doing a costume design because she was an incredible costume designer. And since then I have researched and her, her life and presented about her at the I, USITT conference many years ago. Okay, so back to why did I, you know, joining CSA? So I think I first came to a conference in 1990. So it took quite a while. I was busy, you know, designing costumes all the time. So I came in 1990 to Washington, DC. Obviously I grew up in Fairfax County. I had to come. I was just like so motivated to be present when it was in Washington, DC, because I adore that city. Um, and the theme that year was appearance and gender in, in 1990. I want to remark for for our reference here. I don't know if other um, um, oral history uh, records that we have have talked about this. I hope they have, but I just want to reiterate for everyone's um, memory or uh, new information that we had a presentation by a um, performance artist in 1990. So we weren't calling them that then. She was an she was an actor, but her her presentation was about gender fluidity and she was um, transforming herself through this solo performance from male to female and back. And she did have costume props, but the point she was making was, was how clearly um, gendered behavior is ingrained on the body, on the body itself and how we present ourselves in our public settings. So. We were looking at, at something about um, gender fluidity way back in 1990. So I think that's pretty fascinating. That was very amazing to me too, because she wore black, I remember. Just the way she did her hair, like completely slicked back. Did, did she, and she did one that was 
neither male or female, so it was right. kind of neutral, mm -hmm. how she was sitting and so on. It was very eye-opening. Very eye-opening. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was good. It was good for everyone. Yeah. So how has CSA helped your career? This uh this is important, right? This is so important. It's about uh learning, of course, being exposed to things that you don't have the time to research yourself and um developing contacts and friendships, professional friendships, and sometimes deep friendships like mine with you, Linda. Um, but that's the main thing. But of course, you know, I could call on people for letters of recommendation. So, you you know, when you need to separate yourself from those who you've collaborated with and those that you have been in an educational setting with, like they've taught you already, you can't solicit their letters, but you can get them from other colleagues that you've met at Costume Society that you have at least polite relationships with and they're conscious of you and your work so it's been uh it was helpful to me in that way um and then just obviously like i said the learning that goes on and 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 um exposure to um not only the exhibits and um tours that we get to participate in but those things that happen in the walkways those conversations that's how it's helped me i don't know yeah, so the Washington DC, this should be a good year for you because it's I'm very excited. <laughs> I am very um, excited this year. Okay, so you and I have gone to Greece a number of times. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about that and what kind of impression Greece made on you as far as fashion history is concerned. Yeah. Okay. Well, so here we have a picture. So I've been to Greece three times with you, Linda. One time was really just a tour trip. And um on that trip, I believe, is when I first saw the golden signet rings at the Heraklion Archaeological Museum on Crete, where the Minoan culture's um, most precious artifacts are still held. It's been renovated and they're held there. There are some Minoan artifacts from the Bronze Age in Athens, of course, and then at particular site locations with small museums, but the Heraklion in um in crete is really the master spot for seeing the works and so uh seeing not only castings of small stone seals you know tiny ones as large as your fingernail but so castings meaning i was looking at a, a, a an impression um or the golden signet rings were in their special room of course and so brightly lit and they just struck me deeply i i'd already had dr barber for my history class, I'd already done um, one project. So while I was in graduate school with Do and Dr. Barber's course, um, because I had sewing skills and I had taken art history, I, I was analyzing this image from the collection of frescoes found at Akrotiri. So these are from the 15th, 16th century BC. Um, and are well preserved. They're the best preserved uh, wall paintings that or frescoes that we have from prehistoric Minoan Greece. This is a picture of a pubescent girl collecting saffron, and we call her the saffron gatherer. And she's uh, many art historians have analyzed these paintings, and we can estimate her age at a, as about 11 or so. Um, so I just was determined that there was through the weave of the pattern in the weave of the fabric would tell me what grain the fabric was on or potentially either this way or that way and etc. So I did a series of experiments what what um, Dr. Barber would call recreations. Recreations that's the word she likes to use and so I um, use both linen and wool and obviously trim tapes to um, define the covering of seams and i did several variants comparing them directly to the artwork in order to actually represent what the artist depicted having confidence in the artist that they're showing us where the wrinkles are and it all came down to this wrinkle under the arm because this one happens to be um linen and it's cut on the bias and it's cut with as little um, 
seeming as possible. And so that was sort of what I developed and that's what I got the Adele Filene Award for. And of course, um, published it in the Agium series, which is strictly on Minoan culture. So what happened in Greece, going back to what happened with my travels in Greece, there's the signet ring that inspired me. Its name is the Ring of Isopata. It's found in a location called Isopata and it depicts um, women dancing, so to speak. It appears that they're dancing if you think about movement. Now remember, these are tiny signet rings. I mean, large, it's not just initials, right? There's a picture in there, but it's uh, it's about an inch wide, lengthwise, this oval is. And um, so I studied it. I read all the pertinent information in the archeological publications. And then I developed, again, through experimentation, this recreation, which is made out of a square. It's a square folded in two, you know, just across the bias and then all the frills or flounces, as we call it, a flounced skirt, um, are added only to one triangle of that square. The other triangle is just basically the lining. And so the bias edge, then the fold, becomes what goes around the waist and falls down the front to make the long points that we can see when we look at the illustration in the ring. So there was a lot of um, brouhaha about my proposal. Um, and I presented in Greece in 20, 2004. Yeah, this is 2004 at a conference sponsored by the Peloponnesian Folklore Foundation. Um, so can I ask, you know, that little, oh, I, have, I can, I don't know, you can see me pointing, but there's that little figure way up in the sky. Yeah. She's got one of those skirts on too. She does. Um, I, I, thank goodness I have a decent memory. I, I can recall that the scholar who's written about the sky in this ring, his name is Kyriadakis, his last name, Kyriadakis. And he, um, using new technologies, he, he wrote this about 15 years ago or so, but he was able to identify the season, the celestial sky is depicted through the motifs in the sky. There's a snake and there's the um, tiny woman, the tiny female going up in the sky and a few other symbols in here. And he could match them up, not just from this ring, but his focus was on identifying the the season for this ring, which is springtime, versus um, other depictions of things in the sky and using uh, new technology about um, how the planets and stars move through the sky and matching it up with the time period. So it's a fascinating sort of verification of the work, indicating that it can't be a fake. Dr. Barber and I have talked about this because some people think the gold rings are all fake, right? But Kyriadakis's research sort of proves the truth that they're real. Yes, the more of these skirts that you see, the more sense that your skirt uh, reproduction or recreation makes sense to me. It makes sense to me, but you know, I made it so. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, the hang up, just to share with others, the hang up for some people who were not experts in this field, like the conference, this conference was not all Greek prehistorians, right? It was a lot of people from a lot of fields because the theme was pleats. So obviously my garment has pleats in it. The theme of the conference was pleats. Um, but people said, well, what's the predicate? And I'm like, well, it's an island culture. Sometimes you don't have a predicate, right? Um, there, there was trade ongoing, et cetera. But it, I think I know where the predicates are now. At the time, I didn't know, but now I do. Over in Iraq, that's where they were. Similar thing. Yes, I see an article in your future. <laughs> <laughs> we reading the tea leaves here. Um, so what are you working on now? Not that article, I know, but <laughs> what yeah, are you? Yeah. Well, I'm really fascinated with sort of long haul stories, it's become obvious to me. Th things that um, take a long time to research and uh, um, kind of have endless strands and you just have to call the, call the shot, right? And finally get it done. So one of the things I'm working on is um, 
young female females from Java who were the dancing performers at the World's Fairs where Java was represented. And most of some of these um, representations of Java in uh, huts and making batik and making metalwork, et cetera, um, where, where natives were brought in to live in the villages. And um, I think many of us will be aware that the World's Fairs had these kinds of environments where humans were on display. Um, but I became particularly interested in the young females and their dancing, and not just their dancing, but what they wore and how popular they were, particularly in Paris. So um, sometimes they're called Serimpis and sometimes they're called Tandak. And I think Tandak is, of course, the more accurate term for them. They were accompanied by a family member, whether it was a father or an uncle, aunt or sister or mother. And um, we know the names of the ones that were in Paris in 1900. So um, we do have some specific information. Singer Sargent painted, John Singer Sargent, the American painter who lived in Paris, was painting them. All the paintings are in private hands, so you can't see them, but I've you know, been able to research them and look at them. And other artists were painting them. They were in the newspapers. They were just the celebrities of the moment in 1900 Paris. And other girls had been here in America in 19. Eight, sorry, 1893, and of course in Paris in 1898. So um, their presence resonates for me in a certain set of fashion elements happening in the Western world much later. So I'm working with memory theory relative to cultural memory and investigating um, um, the influences that I see from their um, presence in the Western cities. That's one, that's one. I have another project. So this long haul story here is, um, well, my dissertation was on how batik came into America and that exposed me to um, the arts and crafts movement here in America, which is so very distinct from the one in Britain and um, from its iterations in the rest of Europe. Um, uh, just to lay that on the table, it's it's not the same. So I still have a project I'm working on on identifying and um, categorizing ornamentation on American arts and crafts attire. Batik would be an element that came into America through connections with the European design movements and was spread through the arts and crafts clubs as well as through the avant-garde artists who took it up. What we are looking at in the slide is part of my long haul story I'm looking at. I, I'm just interested in, in human creativity a, around the globe. And I see wax and other paste resist textiles as a prime example for looking at the complexities of human interaction through textiles and human creativity. So what we're looking at first on the uh, left is piece that was found by an archeologist named Oral Stein. It's, it's from the 700 AD, and um, it is a resist decorated, just one color, obviously, one, one set of resist and dye, but highly intricate. And there are other examples in the vast collection, which is housed either in London or in India, that it was split into two, that collection. Um, so that's one aspect that I'm looking at is where are the earliest evidences, evidences of resist decoration, not tie-dye, but paste or wax resists on textiles globally, and there are many. And then over here is just an example of how um, the processes of uh, the 20th century led to, of course, faux batiks, false batiks, printed batiks, imitating the effects that one might get from um, doing the hand process versus a roller printed version. So this is a textile um, that I saw in a private collection and it, it is named Pussy Willow and was produced by the Mallinson Textile Company here in New Jersey. Um, I live in New Jersey, you guys. <laughs> so um, that's, uh, uh, excuse me, sort of showing the spread from prehistory and then um, early um, um, post-Christ date 
the zero date and all the way into fashions in the 20th century. So I'm pulling it all together right now. You're speaking of a, a boutique at the CSA conference in Washington, DC? Yes, I am. I'm going to speak about a Wiener Werkstatt uh, uh, textile that ended up in Ohio. A woman, Mary Jeffrey Shannon, traveled to Vienna and bought the textile at the Wiener Werkstatt workshop and then later in the 30s made it into a dress. You can tell it's the 30s because of the structure of the dress. Um, and then her career um, blossomed into being the one of the first textile consultants for the industry as she built her own business in New York City later on. So she was a professional in the fashion field eventually. But as a young woman graduated from college, she bought a Wiener Werkstatt textile when she had the chance. So I'm trying to analyze it relative to um, how the um, motifs were applied to the fabric. How, how was it decorated? Um, to help to contribute to um, cataloging, so to speak, or having in the record um, every iteration of a Wiener Werkstatt textile that we can locate. Well, I look forward to hearing that. Good. What is one last thing we should know about you? Well, that's not, not <laughs> fashion related. Not there fashion. it is. So, so I, lo I, lo I love felines. I like felines of all kinds. So therefore, I have pets that are cats. And so there you see my three um, cats that I live with, with my husband, Fafar Bayat. And um, maybe you'll guess that um, this black Persian cat is sort of my favorite. <laughs> He's over there helping me write, you see. So um, his, his name is Stoner because we follow motorcycle racing, the MotoGP, which is the fastest motorcycle racing that happens. And we follow it every season went to Italy to see some of it. So we named him after a very famous Australian MotoGP motorcycle rider, whose name was Stoner, last name, Stoner. Yeah, I thought he was a marijuana smoking cat. No. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people, I, I do have one thing I'll add, which, which is an area that I didn't represent already, which is I, um, and, I, and it's, it goes back to CSA and how it helped my career and I think helped our history. I mean, honestly, helped textile history. So I lived in Thailand as a child and I saw many Chinese women um, walking on the boulevards, let's call them, in, in Bangkok wearing black shiny trousers, particularly the Chinese element, right? Not the Thai people. And um, at, con at the conference in Hartford many years ago, which I know, Linda, you were on the organizing committee for the conference at Hartford, um, Xu Hua Lin came to that conference and did um, the, the kind of presentation that isn't an oral report. She had a table and she had all these textiles because she wanted to show people what these textiles were. And I immediately, I mean, I just gravitated to her. I said, I know these textiles. I saw them in Thailand. I never touched one, but I saw them. And I, so I was remembering things from fifth and sixth grade. And I said, I know this textile. So we ended up in a three-way partnership with Margaret Odonez, and we wrote two articles about these textiles, which are coated with mud. Sometimes they're called um, mud dyed or mud, mud coated. And so we published for the um, American Institute of Con Conservation and in another place, I'd have to remember where that is. Um, but I wrote mostly about the sociological aspects and how it uh, these textiles were who wore them as not everyone wore them perhaps they had a, a, a display role relative to the revolution because um, Sun Yat-sen's family was wearing them as far as I can tell and uh, Dr. Ordonez, Mark Margaret Ordonez did the um, textile analysis the spectrometry spectrometry and the microscopic photography and of course a report and Xu Hua um, analyzed the weaves because the weaves can be quite complex with small symbols in the weaves but of course they're solid black and coated with mud at a you know at a very fine level so the weaves are hard to read 
just if you're looking at it from the surface, you have to really get at it with a microscope to see small um, symbols in the totally black fabric. Black well, on one side, sometimes brown on the other, right? Sometimes, because they're dyed in river mud, and so, um, and they're worn on the coastal region, were worn in the coastal regions of China, and um, by boat people, people who live on boats. Anyway, so we contributed. They don't seem like they're caked with mud. It's it's more like a dye by the time. It's yeah. Been, yeah, yes. But if you look at it under a microscope, you can see that it's fibers caked with mud. <laughs> yeah, you do have to treat them with some. I mean, they, they're, they've been used in um, popular uh, fashion design in, in the 21st century, somewhat. Anyway, I wanted to at least share that because that would be an other, another field or sub area that I have made a contribution. You, uh, knowing you as both a, a historian, but also someone who really enjoys theory, can you talk a little bit about um, what you see as uh, the role of theory within history and how history can be informed by theory and what theories um, have really been uh, instrumental to your approach to histories um, mm -hmm. across time and place? Sure. I'm actually going to diverge a little bit to another story because I think it's a fun one for everyone to hear. So when I was in Greece for these two presentations, on the second presentation in 2010, um, I presented on a photographer, something totally you know different, but she was a fashion photographer from South Africa named Lolo Veliko. Um, Linda mm -hmm. and I went off to an island, an island, and we were sort of hermitaging while we waited for, I was going to another conference in Denmark at the Center for Textile Research, where they research prehistoric textiles, particularly Northern European ones, but um, one of them, um, Marie Louise Nosh is a, um, a GN expert. But on um, May, May, April 14th, the uh, volcano in Iceland erupted and you couldn't get out. But Linda and I were unaware. <laughs> so on this island, while we're waiting a few days to go in our uh, different directions, and finally someone said, did you hear? And we were like, what? Hear what? What are you talking about? They, uh, ooh. So then suddenly we were rushing to get out of Greece. Um, Linda made it out of Greece on the last flight out of Greece because that volcano, of course, if you were watching any news or conscious at that moment in history in 2010, um, you couldn't fly in the Atlantic or Europe or most most of Eastern United States at all because the ash particles were so thick that it would, um, well, a plane couldn't fly, right? Well, they were drifting down every few hours. They were getting, I didn't yeah. even go back to Boston. I ended, I ended up going to New York. <laughs> yeah, you didn't fly to where you were supposed to fly to, right? And in my case, I was supposed to fly to um, Copenhagen for, for my first on-site experience with um, the Center for Textile Research at the University of Copenhagen. And I was gonna present on theory, so there's the link, Katie. Um, and huh, it was such hard work, you know, it's just because it was a scramble in every direction. Anyway, I made it there. Um, the airline, which was a European airline, got us a bus that took us across Greece to, um, then get a ferry for 20 hours over to Italy, which now the archeologist later told me, oh yeah, that's the one we always take to bring our stuff over to the islands for our digs in the summer. So they knew about this particularly long slog across the Mediterranean on a slow ferry. Of course, our bus was with us. We then drive north through Europe to Copenhagen. Everyone on the plane, of course, was going to Copenhagen. That was, we were a plane, a plane set of, um, 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 travelers, and um, it was all uh, middle school students accompanied by their professors because they'd been on a trip to Greece for whatever reason, and then just a young um, couple of lovers that were sitting near me. And we had a Greek driver who spoke no Danish and no English, <laughs> and no one else spoke Greek. So it was quite fun. <laughs> we were having a hard time and they would get up there and say, no, you have to turn this way, you have to turn that way, but we finally made it. So anyway, I was able to present in Copenhagen at the center and um, my um, point there in 2010 was to encourage 
those in the field of archaeology, particularly in ancient Greece, to think about embodied practice. And of course, I was calling on Joanne Entwistle's research about embodied practice, because I think she's the one who really laid it out there for us. And of course, I'd already used the concept when I would make recreations, because my recreations had to be used by human bodies in order to prove to me that they were appropriate. You know, that wearing the stuff is important, right? We need to investigate that. And of course, that comes from my life as a theater person making clothes that will enable actors to do what they need to do, right? And, and of course, it all fit, fit, fit together. So I will say that embodied practice from Joanne Itwistle is key. Um, and the other would be Sandra Nissan with her um, reorienting fashion theater um, edited book, but her own essay as well um, about uh, reframing theory so that it is not so restrictive. Because we had, as I had mentioned from my hist my theory class in graduate school, um, we framed fashion theory around capitalism and um, marketing, not around more fundamental things that people do, like embodied practice. And so um, um, that's, that's my key message there. And then as I mentioned, um, memory theory has been uh, used by Heike Jentz, who's at um, Parsons. And I'm inspired by her work and just the introduction of the notion that memory can be embedded in things and pass through a society. I mean, of course we know about folklore, et cetera, but how do we theorize that, right? So memory theory helps us to theorize, um, I'm thinking of how some things reside for a long time before they emerge visually or maybe politically, if we think about the time we're in. So, um, those are my those are my two key ones, Katie. Um, thinking about this being, you know, the big celebration of CSA in its 50th year, um, are there things that you would like to see in the future of CSA? The things that obviously we want to celebrate our past, but what is what is the future of CSA um, from your perspective? Oh, put you on the spot. <laughs> Lay it out there. Well, I, I do think we'll continue um to present artifact study because we need it right we must have artifact study we must have the science applied to the artifacts especially in archaeology right um, we have to have science applied um, spectrometry and microscopy microscopy or dye analysis etc as well um, um, historical studies that seem relatively linear but reveal information, and then also theoretical studies. I think we will, we'll, I do believe, we'll find a way to thrive by respecting all aspects of what might be done in order to understand what humans have done in their activity um, relative to trade, politics, creativity, technology, and participation in fashion systems. And I, that's, uh, my vision. Um, I do hope that we have um, increased presence from people who practice in museums because they're critical to uh, profiling, meaning being present out there in the public view. And we know that um, these sorts of exhibits are extremely popular in museums, so we just need to keep uh, growing and building on those themes, in my opinion. Excellent. That sounds like a future I want to be a part of, so it sounds lovely. So a comment from Carolyn, so much interesting and thought-provoking information for people interested in textiles, especially folk textiles. I need to listen to the presentation again and take notes, and then I'll have some questions. Memory theory, embodied practice, these are com concepts I had not heard about, so it sounds like uh, you'll be hearing from Carolyn to, to hear okay. more about Very those theories. Um, all right, well, yes. I see a few former grad students who are participating tonight. So just a shout out to them. And maybe one last question to Abby about how graduate students enrich your own 
work? Well, sure, of course I can comment on that. Katie Baker was one of my graduate students, so she's enriching my life here, right here in this moment. But um, I have to say that working with graduate students in particular is was gratifying. I don't have a, a graduate program where I am. I'm teaching undergraduates um, and enjoying it very much, but they're not doing the great research that graduate students were doing at the University of Rhode Island when I was there. Um, yeah, so I, I would I would call out Katie and I would call out um, an undergraduate I taught at uh, University of Rhode Island, Emily Pasco, who um, was in the honors program and I was teaching in the honors program and now she's a faculty member and she researches in Guatemala. She's learned Spanish and you know she's just been inspiring to me in terms of um, effort and tenacity to reach her goal after practicing in the industry for a while. So. Um, if nothing else, and I hope this is true for all of my professors, that your students can be an inspiration um, from their effort to reach their goals. You know, it's just so exciting, and and of course gives you an opportunity to give back to them as a mentor. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Gives me an opportunity, I should say. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, both to Abby and to Linda for this conversation this evening. So thank you so much for attending. Have a great evening. Good night. Good night. Well.